Welcome to The Business. I'm Larry Akinola. On this show, we break down business and its impact on Africa and Africans. Business affects every one of us, whoever we are, wherever we are. In the news this week, Kenya issues an ultimatum to expatriates in the country to get valid work permits within 60 days or be deported. Ghana's president orders the arrest of the country's football association head for fraudulently using his name. The week's big story is the African Development Bank's annual meetings. They took place in the South Korean city of Busan and focused on industrialization. And in this week's breakdown, we look at the rise in oil prices. Is it good news for Africa? Joining me throughout for commentary and insight is business reporter David Thomas. And in part two, I'll be talking to Manji Cheto, business development manager at the London Stock Exchange Group. Expatriates living in Kenya have been given 60 days to formalize their work status or get out. Is it a case of Kenya first? David, why is Kenya cracking down on its expatriate community? What's this all about? Well, Anyone who's been to Nairobi knows that there's a huge expatriate community working in services, banking, but particularly aid and development and also um, kind of anti-corruption, all those kind of sectors. Um, and not all of them bother to register when they get to Kenya. It's easy to get to Kenya, you get a visa on arrival and I guess they just go about their work, right? Absolutely. And the Kenyan government reckons that there's about 30,000 people legally in the country with the right documentation. But they've decided to crack down now and they say that if you don't have the right documentation, within six months you're at risk of being booted out of the country. And one of the uh, interesting sort of context here is that I think a couple of years ago there, there was a proposed law to sort of crack down on NGOs. It was, there was a lot of furore about it, but one of the issues a lot of African governments have is that you have NGOs that come in and they go about doing their work and they don't even bother to let you know. And sometimes they're doing things like, you know, healthcare delivery and public service delivery. So on some level you just need to know what people are doing, I guess. Yeah, you certainly need to know, and the Kenyan government wants to know what uh, uh, foreigners are up to in the country um, and there's a couple of reasons for that one is that they so they can increase the tax net and bring these workers into the formal sector and the other one is so that they can make sure that Kenyans who are looking for jobs have a fair crack against against foreigners and one thing that's interesting is we're used to African migrants being thrown out of the West I guess it's uh, refreshing to see that uh, you know Africa can also crack down on European expatriates who come over and you know have a good time out sure. there I guess refreshing is one way to put it, um, <laughs> although you could see it as a kind of spread of this, di uh, this kind of uh, anti-immigrant sentiment that's taking place in Europe and also the United States. Um, but I think most people would say it's reasonable for Kenya to be aware of uh, who's in the country and uh, I think that's what they'll be looking forward to doing over the next few months. All right, get a work permit or get out. Ghana's president, Nano Akufo-Addo, has accused the head of his country's football association, Kwesi Nantakchi, of fraudulently using the president's name to court investors. David, I was initially excited about this story when I heard that he had uh, ordered, uh, issued an arrest warrant for the FA association head. Turns out it's just because he's been using the president's name, not because of really trying to tackle corruption here. Sure, and the, the head of the Ghanaian Football Association has um, almost been in trouble in the past. There was an expose by the Telegraph a few years ago suggesting that he'd been involved in some kind of match fixing. So it's not the first time that issues of corruption have arisen within the Ghanaian Football Association. And it's strange that it's only this time brought the attention of the authorities, perhaps because the, the president of the association used the president's name to try and induce It, it feels uh, that way, and that's a bit of a shame because this issue of corruption and bad governance in football associations, it's one that is a problem across Africa. And we've seen it play out very embarrassingly at major tournaments. Ghana had a big fiasco around unpaid bonuses and pay disputes and etc. Et and that's also a symptom of corruption and poor governance. So could this uh, maybe stimulate a little bit of debate around this? Yes, for uh, such a huge sport, as football is in Africa, it's extraordinarily badly run. Um, for years, uh, most of the heads of the football associations have um, really struggled to impose order on the game and in some cases have been personally liable for corruption. Uh, FIFA, the world, governing, excuse me, the world governing body, hasn't necessarily helped with things. 
uh, because it's generally given money to football associations regardless of whether they've cleaned up their act. So this is certainly an issue that goes far beyond Africa, but it's particularly prevalent on a continent. And, and it's not just about what happens on the pitch. We've seen it affect teams at major competitions, but football is a billion, multi-billion dollar industry now, and Africa supplies a lot of talent to European leagues. Week in, week out, hundreds of millions tune in, and partly to, to see African footballers, including Mo Salah, who is one of the biggest names in football at the moment. Yet, if you go to Africa, there's virtually nothing going on by way of investment, by way of a domestic league development, and so on and so forth. So there's a, there's a deeper a problem here around economic development and a business opportunity. Sure. I mean, there's been very little real talk of reform in African football, given its overall contribution to the world game. As you mentioned, hundreds of Premier League players, some of the greats, in fact, came from Africa. And yet very little seems to go back to the continent, uh, and very little is delivered. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see whether these uh, these moves in Ghana have a wider cultural impact on the game and in other countries. Well, for now, let's just hope Africa does well at the World Cup next month. A big story this week is the annual meetings of the African Development Bank, which took place in Busan, South Korea. Finance ministers from across Africa and other dignitaries met to discuss the continent's industrialization. David, first of all, interesting that this happened in Korea. What does it tell us about the changing nature of development in Africa? It doesn't seem like an obvious place for the African Development no. Bank to be meeting. No, it's certainly significant that it's taking place in Busan in Korea. Um, they're not a country generally regarded as showing a, a huge amount of interest in Africa, either on the development side or the investment side. They're far overshadowed by their uh, regional China. neighbors, China, of course. Um, but. I think this shows probably that Korea's trying to, you know, get some skin in the game, um, trying to get interested in Africa. And you know, they've they've hosted a conference this week and they've announced a number of quite large initiatives to to kick things forward. And it's reflective of the changing nature of of Africa's international relationships. We all know about Beijing and, and China, but uh, there, there are a lot of players here, and Korea is one of those. Malaysia is increasingly looking at at Africa, and Asia as a region has become hugely significant to the continent. Sure, I think we disproportionately probably hear about the Chinese story, which isn't surprising given that they're estimated to have given about $100 billion for Africa over the last 15 years. But perhaps the more interesting things are going on in some of these smaller countries. And I think Korea's, um, Korea's bid this week for $5 billion in financial assistance um, is relatively significant against that backdrop. I and mean, it'll be interesting to see how they go forward with this. All right, well, we'll have to see if Africa can emulate the Korean growth miracle. In this week's breakdown, oil prices have passed the $80 mark for the first time since November 2014, with some predicting they could hit $100 next year. David, Africa's oil producers have been waiting for this moment. It's been a horrible uh, two or three years for them. Growth has nosedived. Surely in the short term, this has to be good news for oil exporters. Absolutely. I mean, if we look at last July, oil prices were just hovering around $45 a barrel, um, and now they're up to 80 um, that's really quite a significant uptick for Africa's largest producers. If you look at Nigeria and Angola, it just gives the government much more reassurance. Uh, it allows them to go forward with some of their spending plans. Uh, and particularly for Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari, I mean, this is huge news as he it's good seeks... good timing, right? Absolutely, as he seeks re-election. Um, you have to say it's, uh, it's a real sweetener for him. The big question is, have they learned their lesson? Because this is not the first time we've been through a cycle like this. Oil prices go up and down. Every time they go down, we find that Nigerian oil, uh, African oil producers are struggling. They're running out of cash. North is, uh, growth is nose diving. You haven't got broad-based growth. It's all about what they do with this money. Sure. And interestingly, um, Nigeria has been talking a lot about oil diversification over the last few years. But if we just look at the first quarter of this year, non-oil growth was only 0.76%, whereas oil growth was far higher at around 34%. So there's been a lot of talk of diversification, looking to new sectors of the economy, agriculture. But when we see very little delivered, and this is a recurring theme. Uh, for Africa watchers. Yeah, the problem is that often it is just talk, right? And and we've we've been here before. It's cyclical. We hear a lot of rhetoric about driving diversification. As soon as oil prices come back up, those plans are abandoned and we're right back to where we started. Is there a real risk this is going to happen again? I think given past history there's a very real risk that could happen again. Um, We've been in this, you know, a lot of African countries have been in this oil trap where they become overly dependent on oil, uh, the resource curse as it's known, and it really 
distracts them from doing what they should be doing, which is sensible governance reforms and boosting other sectors of the economy. What should be the priorities in terms of sectors for oil producers to invest in? Well, there's been a lot of talk of a green revolution in Africa over the last few years, which is really an attempt to overhaul uh, an agricultural sector which is far less productive than it ought to be. Um, so that really has to be part of any plan to, to, to diversify the economy, um, particularly as Africa imports so much food. And of course, driving structural transformation, that's one of the key issues we haven't seen, right? With still this reliance on non-productive sectors. Yeah, um, and I think uh, especially Africa's biggest countries, uh, biggest oil producers, need to start moving with that. Uh, we've heard the pledges from Angola, we've heard the pledges from Nigeria, and now there needs to be concrete action. They need to put their money where their mouth is, right? Absolutely. David, thank you so much for joining me on The Business today. Join me in part two when I'll be talking to Manji Cheto, Business Development Manager at the London Stock Exchange Group. Back to the business, the show where we break down business and its impact on Africa and Africans. I'm Lan Rekin and I'm pleased to welcome Manji Cheto, Business Development Manager at the London Stock Exchange Group. Manji, thank you so much for joining me on the business today. Hi Lan Ray. It's, uh, it's turning out to be a pretty busy year for the London Stock Exchange. It's turning out to be a pretty busy year for capital markets in Africa. Yeah. And I'm talking specifically about listings. We're seeing a lot of African companies queuing up to have some big IPOs on the London Stock Exchange. Now, just for the benefit of the viewer, an IPO is when a company sells shares publicly for the first time. Yeah. You know this doesn't happen very much in Africa. Give us a little bit more of, of an insight as to what's driving the interest and what, what are some examples of what's coming through and what does it tell us about investment and growth? So I think um, on the London Stock Exchange, I mean, we are effectively, we're, we're proud to say we're the second largest African exchange um, in the world after the JSE. And um, from our position, we've really seen an uptick in the number of listings coming in this year. We had um, Vivo Energy, a Pan-African um, fuel retailer, um, that listed with a market cap of about $2.3 billion and they managed to raise about £603 billion. Um, pounds. And I think this year is quite an exciting year if we look at the trends because we do have a number of other jumbo listings um, that are planned um, for Africa. Obviously, I don't think it would be right for me to talk about these, but some of these have been sort of speculated already in, in the press. In terms of what I think is driving it, I think two things. Obviously, we've had a bit of an uptake in the African economic environment and, and that's also helping sort of investors to, to turn their eye towards the continent again and making companies feel that it's it's kind of the right time for them to do the, the capital raise that they need um, on the London markets. And they, these listings for the companies, they're, they're part of going even bigger, right? Mm. So what's exciting about this is that you're starting to see the emergence of, of African homegrown co uh, companies that really are starting to reach the kind of scale that we usually associate with non-African multinationals. Absolutely. And in fact, you, you raise a really good point because one of the things I think will pretty much drive the valuations of the listings is diversification. Of, of risks and that's diversification I think across sectors and across countries um, if I look at our pipeline this year for example most of the companies that are going to be listing on, on and, and to generate the sort of press um, um, furry that we, we basically need um, to support these listings a lot of these companies are operating across a number of markets in Africa and I think that's that's quite good for Africa because it really kind of speaks to that pan-African business um, environment that we want to see and a lot of people have been talking about for, for years. And you said the, the LSE is Africa's second largest exchange after the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. How many African companies are listed on the London Stock Exchange? Um, at the moment we've got about 108 um, African companies with a total market capitalization of 206 billion. Um, but you know, we are not less resting on our laurels. We want to have um, more companies um, listing because we ultimately believe that these companies are the ones that are going to drive Africa's economic transformation. You, you, you have very good relationships with a number of African exchanges. I know there's a very strong relationship with the Nigerian Stock Exchange, clearly with the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Now, one dynamic that is uh, prevalent across the continent is we don't see many listings on African exchanges. Now, there, sometimes we have dual listings, mm. but it tends to be Johannesburg and London. 
why is it that Africa's capital markets in general aren't seeing these kinds of listings? I don't necessarily think that it's right for me to comment on um, what local exchanges can do, but, but I can give you a, a sort of top line view. I think some of the concerns has to do with the actual depth of the capital markets. I mean, you mentioned we're seeing a lot of jumbo listings. The size of, of the capital raise is such that the local markets themselves are not able to sort of um, provide um, the amount of, of capital that the companies need. But then there's also a question of liquidity. What happens post your IPO? You effectively need to have a sufficient amount of trading on your stock um, for you to, to have the right kind of price formation, right? And I think that's a key concern for a lot of companies when they look to come to London. So, so if I can paraphrase that, there's just not enough money in the system. Exactly. Right. Well, look, we've, we've, sp we've spent quite a bit of time talking about listings and it's exciting. Another big trend for this year is euro bonds. Bonds, yeah. bonds, bonds. Go African governments are issuing euro bonds as if it's going out of fashion. Angola, very recently, I know you were personally involved in this, they launched a $3 billion euro bond at the London Stock Exchange. Great news for the, for the LSE. Is it great news for Africa? Because the bigger picture here is that some, some institutions, including the IMF and World Bank, have raised a bit of a question mark around the sustainability of the debt that's being taken on across the continent. Is that something that uh, the LSE has got on its mind, or is that, does that really factor into how you guys operate? Well, we definitely do think about it, and I, and I, and I, but, I, but I think, unfortunately, debt has sort of got a bad rap. Um, if you think about what is um, pretty much driving the concerns around African debt, it's because it's dollar denominated debt, right? So one of the things that we're trying to do with the London Stock Exchange is to develop a local currency bond market that effectively takes away some of that foreign exchange risk that company um, countries are facing when they look to raise money and on international markets. So effectively, it means that you're able to basically raise money in international market on the scale that you need, but in your local currency to that takes away some some of that, um, you know. Easier said than done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I do think, you know, central banks um, across the continent will sort of rightly be concerned around macroprudential risks and they basically need to ensure that they've got the right tools for that to happen. So that's a conversation that we continue to engage with um, African regulators um, to, to, to help drive. But, but, but we certainly recognise that concern. But at the same time, I think people need to recognise that if, if Africa is going to grow at the scale that we need it to grow in the infrastructure development, then we do need to actually have well, and, and that's, debt. The, and that's a key dynamic here, right, is that the, the argument isn't you shouldn't borrow. The argument is on what terms are you borrowing what are you using the money for? Exactly. I think that's where the concern is exactly. because every country borrows. I mean, it's how you finance development. It's just kind of how it works. But it, the question is, how is that managed? And, and that, that's where the concern for Africa comes in, surely. Yes, and I totally agree with that. But but I think also another thing that we need to um, focus on here is not just why the sovereign is borrowing, but the, the, the sovereign borrowing really opens up room for, for the companies, which I think is really where the, the growth driver is going to come in, um, in Africa. It opens up room for those companies to actually borrow themselves so that the, the, the debt burden in Africa is not just placed on the sovereign, but actually goes on, um, is, is passed on as well to, to the private sector, where I think people are, will agree that there's been a much better management of, of debt across um, the private sector. Now, speaking on the record, um, are you concerned about debt or is that not something that you're, you're willing to comment on in Africa? Am I concerned about debt? Well, I'm, of course, I, I think debt is always going to have a, a level of concern for anybody that, it, that is involved in it. But do I, if I look at the scale of the opportunity and, and also the scale of the need for financing in Africa, um, ultimately, I, I would say that, you know, I don't think we're quite at the points that are alarming yet. I do think they are they are concerns, but I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think sometimes some of this is a little bit overblown and, and hopefully some of the foreign um, currency or foreign exchange risk um, shall he help mitigate the the debt sustainability concerns. Well, I'll just tell you what concerns me is that some of the figures, especially on things like debt servicing and debt to, debt to GDP ratios, are back to pre-debt forgiveness levels. And we all know what that was like. But perhaps we can pick up that discussion another time. I want to move on to something I know you're going to like talking about. And that is uh, a project that the London Stock Exchange is running for the second year now, which yep. is called Companies to Inspire Africa. What's that all about? So Companies Inspire Africa really came um, as a result of um, our view of the exchange that, you know, while we had a lot of these jumbo listings from Africa, we felt that there were a lot of SMEs across Africa that were doing really exciting things. And we felt that we had a responsibility to help profile these companies, um, primarily really to private investors to help them raise private capital. Because ultimately, um, whether companies, you know, raise 
um, private capital or, or they end up on, on the um, stock markets. I think for us, we recognize that ultimately companies need capital. And so what we um, decided to do was to profile a number of SMEs across Africa. And this was truly a pan-African project. We got a number of our partners to basically nominate companies that they felt were doing really exciting things in the SME space. And we featured them. We have 343 companies in our first publication. Our goal this year I've is I've seen to it. Get... It's, very, it's a very nice book, a really nice book. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is something that we're very proud of at the exchange. And we're hoping to actually launch the second edition uh, by November this How year. many companies are you aiming for this year? We're aiming for a thousand. A thousand. We're being quite okay. ambitious. Oh, and then good. if anyone looking at the African continent, I mean, we, we, we were talking about, you know, 54 countries on the continent. It's not that difficult to get to a thousand. Be, right? It shouldn't be. Some of the challenges is, is around actually getting the data verification, as a lot of people watching will understand, verifying the, the data and ensuring that companies are compliant from a legal perspective, from a tax perspective. I mean, those are all things that are important, and we don't want to be featuring companies that are not inspiring Africa. And I guess the, uh, the bigger point, and perhaps you know, uh, um, the more serious point here as well, is that there's an underestimation of how many uh, profitable, high-growth companies there are in Africa. Because I have to admit, when I heard the number for the first year, I was surprised. I thought you'd struggle to get 100. So it was encouraging to hear that you got was it over 300. And uh, 1,000 seems entirely realistic. But that's important from an investment standpoint, because we sometimes think of it as, you know, we know the Dangotes, we know the MTNs, but there's more going on than that, right? Absolutely. And I think one of the things that, that struck me when we published that the first edition of our um, Companies to Inspire Africa was the amount of phone calls I got from, you know, banks and, and law firms saying, oh, who are these companies? Where did they come from? And, and you know, can, can we actually have conversations? I mean, we've done a follow-up report, um, an interim report called, called our Companies to Inspire Africa one year on. And it was actually... Actually, we had about 75 companies that had further capital raise um, privately um, since the back of the first report. So exciting to see what comes this year. All right. Well, I look forward to, to this year's edition. Manji, thank you so much for joining me on The Business. Thank you. That's all we have time for. Thank you for watching The Business. And please join us again next time.